Good morning. Does everyone want just excited to be here today? All right. Richard is. Uh, I, I want to say uh, we sung Holy, Holy, Holy a cappella, which I absolutely love, love that hymn. Uh, but I especially love it a cappella. And I went to a conference several years ago uh, in Louisville. Um, it was called Together for the Gospel. Uh, huge conference. They sell out. Uh, they, they were only doing it every other year, and they were selling out every year. Uh, this big, giant basketball stadium, uh, like 30,000 people going to this conference. And one year uh, that I was there, I went a couple years, but one of the years I was there, uh, they had the Gettys there leading uh, worship, uh, all hymns, and, and we sang Holy, Holy, Holy a cappella uh, with 30,000 people in the stadium, uh, and it was amazing. Uh, but this morning it was great to hear our family, our church family, just singing it out. Uh, and I, I praise God for that. Such a great hymn to sing, um, but I just wanted to commend you on uh, being wonderful singers. Good job. So, not all, you were all behind me, so you didn't hear me singing, which was good for you. Um, all right. Uh, this morning we're going to continue in our series uh, reorientation, and today we're going to talk about a, a gospel reorientation. We're going to talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and. As we start about talking about that, I want to make sure we understand what the gospel is. And then I want to look at kind of how we got off track a little bit with the gospel uh, and how we can get back on track. So I want you to remember that uh, with this series, what we're looking at are, are areas where we've kind of gotten off trail. Uh, and when I say we've gotten off trail, I'm not particularly talking about any one individual here, any specific person, but I think the church, capital C, the church has gotten off trail on, on a few things. Uh, and one of those things is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we have to ask, what is the gospel? What is the gospel of Jesus Christ? We know that the gospel is the good news of Jesus. We know that the gospel is really the, the redemptive work of God here on earth. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is very simple, yet it's very complex. There are a lot of things to the gospel uh, that, that we don't really talk about. The gospel really is uh, an anomaly. It's something that shouldn't work, but it does. The gospel is, is very unique. We can share the gospel uh, through what they call the Romans road to salvation. In uh, Romans chapter 3, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is a wonderful verse to remind us that, that we're all sinners. To know that you're a sinner, you also need to know, though, that there is a God who has set a standard. A standard that he calls us to live by, and we fall short of that standard every time. We know that all of us fall short of the glory of God. We fall short of the standard that God has set for us. It goes on in the Romans Road in Romans 6, 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death. This tells us we are all sinners and we all are deserving of death. When we fall short of the standard that God has set for us, the penalty of falling short is death. But Romans 6, 23 goes on. It says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we aren't lost and without hope, being sinners destined for hell, sinners who are, are due death. There is hope in the gospel. There's hope in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10, <clears throat> verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus and Lord is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. It doesn't start as good news, though. It starts with bad news. There's condemnation that is due. We are, we are all going to be condemned because we have sinned and we have fallen short of the standard that God has left for us. 
That's where the gospel starts. But the hope comes in and the fact that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty that was due because of us. That he came and lived a perfect life so that he could be sacrificed on behalf of our sin. He sacrificed for us. This is the grace of God, the unwarranted favor of God that we did not earn and we do not deserve. Yet God shows his love for us in sending his son Jesus, pouring out his mercy on us and our condemnation on Jesus on the cross. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 tells us that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The condemnation that was due, the fact that we should be condemned to death because we are sinners, was put on Jesus. And because it's put on Jesus, it's not put on us. And all that God says that we have to do is trust in his sacrifice. That's all that he asks of us, is that we would trust in the sacrifice that he has made on our behalf. So we trust in that sacrifice. That is the, that's the gospel. The sacrifice of Jesus for our sins so that we would not be condemned. That's the gospel. So what have we missed? Where have we gone off track with the gospel? And I think where we have gone off track is not what we believe and communicate about the gospel. It's we forget that the gospel applies to every part of our life. The gospel doesn't stop at salvation. When you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, that's not the end of the gospel for you. When you have trusted in his sacrifice, the gospel doesn't stop applying to you because you are now in Christ Jesus. Yes, you are no longer condemned, but the gospel goes on from salvation. The gospel will continue through your entire life. If we look at Ephesians Chapter 2, the first 10 verses show us a beautiful picture of why this is true. The first three verses say, You were dead and your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom you or we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is exactly who every one of us were before God stepped in and did something. This is who we were in our sin and in our condemnation. We see here that we are dead in our trespasses. There's absolutely nothing that we can do. I frequently would tell kids in my youth group or ask kids, what can dead people do? What can dead people do? They can stink. That's it. That's all a dead person can do is stink. A dead person can do absolutely nothing to aid in their salvation. And scripture tells us this is who we were. We were dead in our trespasses. You were dead. It was the... the Schrodinger's cat, right? Both simultaneously dead and alive. You guys know what I'm talking about? Did anybody take psychology? Okay, a couple people. But <clears throat> we are dead in our trespass. There's nothing that we can do. This is who we are. And then Ephesians chapter 2 continues. I must have gone backwards or something. I don't know what I did here. Put up verse 4 for me. Sorry. Zach's helping me out. Somehow I messed it up. All right. I'll just read it to you. Maybe. La, la, la. Just talk amongst yourselves for a minute. Not really. Don't do that. All right. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. Show us something very different. We were dead. There was nothing that we can do. And verse 4 says, but God. I think those two words right there are the most beautiful two words in all of Scripture. But God. 
Think about the transition that takes place here. You're dead. There's nothing that you can do. You are sons of disobedience, children of wrath. Those are not names I want to be called. And then verse 4 says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards you in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Those two words, but God, signal to us that everything is about to change. Everything is about to be different. It says you are dead in your trespasses. You are sons of disobedience, children of wrath. You can do nothing. And then verse four comes in and says, but God, rich in mercy and love, did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And what we need to realize here in Ephesians chapter two is that in this we have a completely new identity. We were dead and we are now alive. We were sinners and now we are righteous. Everything about our life has completely changed. And if the gospel has changed every part of our life, changed even who we are, then it has to affect every part of our life. In 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 17, I put up the wrong verse, uh, it says, I've apparently done that quite a bit today. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us that if we are in Christ, we have put on the new self. The old is gone, the new has come. We are completely new in Christ. We are completely new. Everything about us is new. And so everything has to change. I remember when uh, our family first got to Japan, uh, everything in Japan was new to us. But one of the biggest changes was driving. In Japan, they drive on the left side of the road, which you think, eh, it's just the other side of the road. But you don't realize that when they drive on the left side of the road, that means you get in from the other side of the car. Like the steering wheels on the opposite side. I can't tell you how many times I sat in the passenger seat. And after a while, it gets embarrassing. So you don't get out and walk around. You just scoot over. You're like, I meant to do that. You, or you go to the, the wrong side and so you get like ruffle around in the glove box so people don't know you went to the wrong side like you meant to do that. But everything is different about driving on the left side of the road. Think about the hand that you use to turn on your blinker. In every car you've ever driven in the United States, it's on the exact same spot. Well, in Japan, you have to use the other hand to turn on your blinker. And when you do that, or you get used to it, you turn it on. When you're not used to it, you do what we call the Oki wave. the the Okinawa wave, uh, you mean to turn on your blinker, but the windshield wipers come on because you used the wrong hand. And we call it, you would all, you'd see it all over the place. Be like, oh, they're new. (laughs) They don't know which one the blinker is. You know what else is new? Actually using a blinker. Like people in Japan use their blinker to indicate that they're turning. Here you can turn right on red. You'd think in Japan, you can turn right on red. First of all, if you turn right, you're crossing traffic because you, okay, you're driving on the other side of the road. So Can you turn left on red? Nope, can't turn left on red in Japan. It's just what their rules are. We had to completely learn how to drive again. It was completely new to us. Okay, think about shifting gears. Anybody able to drive a stick shift? Okay, okay. What what hand do you use to shift gears? Okay, not in Japan. Okay, just go sit in the passenger car of your stick shift and try to go through the gears with your left hand. You have to learn how to do it. And we it was completely new. We had to, to learn how to, to drive on the opposite side of the road and to do all of the things that came with it. It wasn't just going to the other side of the road. Everything was different. 
When we look at our life and how it's affected by the gospel, everything is different. Everything in our life has to be affected by the gospel of Jesus Christ because we were dead in our trespasses. And God made us alive in Christ. And so as we look at the gospel, we see that the gospel must affect our attitude towards others. The gospel must affect our attitude towards others. Jesus tells us uh, that, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And what he means by this is the people who realize who they are before God are blessed. The people who realize that we're just sinners, that they Even in Christ, we did nothing to change our status before God, but Jesus did everything. People who realize that everyone is a sinner, those are the ones who are blessed. The gospel ought to keep us humble. When you look around and you realize the person sitting next to you is a sinner, just like you are, it ought to keep you humble. Or when you realize that you yourself are a sinner, and then you look at somebody else and try to judge them for their sin in their life, the gospel reminds you of the humility that you have to have towards other people. We're all sinners, yet we so often try to compare ourselves to the people around us. We look at somebody else's life, and we say, man, I would never be that bad of a sinner. Man, I could never do that much bad or that much evil and we forget about the book of judges that we just went through where the entire world is corrupted the entire world is broken and fallen and we compare ourselves to our neighbor and say i'm not that bad or if you're having a sad day and having a pity party you're saying oh i'm so much worse than everyone else you realize there there's no such thing as greener grass on the other side of the fence The grass is either green or it's not, but there's no greener grass. Life isn't better over there. We're all sinners. We're all broken. We're all fallen, and we have to be humble in that. There's no such thing as greener grass. We're all in the same boat. We're all on the same playing field. We're all sinners. The gospel reminds us of that. The gospel reminds us that we are sinners. Helps us to see that that we're all the same. We shouldn't compare And when you do compare yourself to somebody else, I promise you, you're only going to end up disappointed. Because if you start comparing yourself, you're going to realize you're so much worse than you give yourself credit for. You're so much worse than that. We are all sinners. Instead of comparing ourselves to our friends, comparing ourselves to our neighbors, comparing yourself to the person that you see on Instagram or whatever social media you're on, you need to compare yourself to the Word of God. Compare yourself to the standard in which God set for us, and you'll see we're all the same. Every one of us has failed to keep that standard. Every one of us is a sinner. So we need to treat other people with that humility and realize that we're, we're all in the same boat. They might sin differently than I do, but I'm still a sinner and they're still a sinner. Don't compare the two of you. Compare yourself to the standard, which is God. It also reminds us of what God taught us way back in Genesis chapter 1 when he created the world and he looked out and he saw what he had created was good. He creates man and woman in his own image, image bearers of God, and he looks at them and he says, it is good. And then sin comes into the world. When sin came into the world, it didn't change the fact that All of us are created in the image of God. We were created in the image of God before sin came into the world. We are all image bearers of the one true king. We are all image bearers of God. And when you realize that the brother or sister sitting next to you is an image bearer just like you are, yet they're a sinner just like you are, you realize that we have to treat one another with love. We have to treat one another with humility and respect. We have to truly live like we believe what the gospel tells us is that we are all the same. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. We're all image bearers of the God 
in need of a savior. We have to treat people like we believe that that is true. But the gospel must also affect our perspective on life. The gospel must affect our perspective on life. In Mark chapter 8, it says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel's will save it. The life that we live is no longer about ourselves. When God changes everything in our life, takes us from being dead to being alive, he gives us a new purpose in life. Our life is no longer about ourselves, but it's about Jesus Christ. It's about the gospel. We live our life because of the gospel. God left us here for that. And I will be completely honest with you. It's a very tough realization the day that you realize the world does not revolve around you. How many of you would ever say that you thought the world revolved around you? Okay. That's just not what we, we, we wouldn't say the world revolves around me. But how many of you have gotten behind a slow person at Walmart checkout and you got angry and eager to, to get through there and think, man, they're just going so slow. Why did they come through? This lane was only for 10 items. They've got 11. They should not be in this lane. You think the world revolves around you. You wouldn't say it. You wouldn't say, I think the world revolves around me. But what you are saying is my time is more valuable than theirs. My time is more important than theirs. I've got stuff to do that's, that's more important than their stuff. Been stuck behind a tractor? Okay, yes, you have. You live in Carlinville or the surrounding area. You've been stuck behind a tractor. Been stuck in traffic. Your schedule gets inconvenienced by whatever it is that's happening that inconveniences you. And all of a sudden you're thinking, what I have to do is more important than whatever else is going on. You're thinking the world revolves around you. But we have a purpose here, and it's not us. It's not me. My purpose here has nothing to do with me. My purpose here has to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. My purpose here is to live a life that glorifies God and points others to Jesus. This is why God left us here. It goes on in Mark chapter 16. He says to them, go into the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. This is why you are here. This is your purpose in life, that you would go and share the gospel with all of creation. The gospel changes our perspective on life. <clears throat> chapter 24. This is the gospel or, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. In Mark chapter 13, and the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. Jesus tells us that he is coming again. Jesus is going to return and this world is going to end. A new heaven and a new earth is going to be ushered in. But do you believe it? When Jesus says he is coming again, we're told that we have to go and to preach the gospel to all nations, that first the gospel must be proclaimed to everyone, that God has left us here so that we could preach the gospel. We have a purpose in this life. The gospel tells us that our purpose is to glorify God. Our purpose is to point people to Jesus. But do we live like we believe that that is true? If you get up in the morning and turn on the weather and the weatherman says there's a 100 percent chance it's going to rain today. Are you taking an umbrella with you when you leave the house? If you're an umbrella carrier and you trust the weatherman. Okay. If you know it's going to rain, if you've been told it, it will rain today. Are you concerned whether or not somebody's going to make fun of you for carrying an umbrella and trusting the weatherman? Like, yo, you trust the weatherman? No, I'd rather have an umbrella. If it rains and he's right, I'd rather have an umbrella. Jesus tells us he's coming again. Jesus is going to return. And we have to live our life as if we believe that that is true. There's an urgency in what God has called us to. He says he's coming soon. Soon. I don't know what that means. 
could be today. Lord willing, it's today. It could be a hundred years, a thousand years. But our perspective on life is affected by the gospel. The gospel also affects our boldness. Romans chapter 1, 16. It was in the video that we showed. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. I am not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is for everyone. It applies to every person who has ever been created. The gospel is for everyone. We've been given the mission, the job, to be bold in our faith and share the gospel with each and every person. None of the fears that we have matter when you realize and you believe that Jesus is coming again. And all of those fears will go away at the, <clears throat> the, the second coming of Jesus. When God restores the perfection of his creation, none of those fears will matter. But until then, you look at a verse like this and you realize that those fears don't matter right now because it's the gospel that is the power of change. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes people. It's the gospel that may change that person who is judging you for sharing the gospel, who is judging you for carrying an umbrella when the weatherman said it was going to rain. The gospel will change that person's life just like it changed your life, just like it took your life from dead and made it alive. The gospel is the power to change lives, the power for salvation. And so if we live out the gospel, we can be bold in everything that we do. See, in Matthew chapter 10, it says, Do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. We don't need to worry about what people think of us. In John chapter 10, it's like it works over here. It says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. We don't have to worry about any of the fears that we have in this world. None of them matter compared to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel affects every aspect of our life. Everything that we are. And if we truly believe that, if we truly believe that the gospel has changed us from dead into life, and the gospel has the power to change every individual, and we truly believe that Jesus is coming again just like he said he was, then we need to live as if we believe that it's true. We need to live as if we believe that it's true. So the only question we have now is how do we want to live? Do we want to live like we believe God or do we want to live like we fear man? That's the question we have. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to have a time of uh, invitation, a time for you to respond uh, to whatever God might be calling you to. The first response is to respond to the gospel. I want to remind you that, that every person everywhere in all of the world responds to the gospel. Either you accept it or you reject it. There is no, I'm not ready. I'm not ready is rejecting it. There's only two responses, to accept or reject. Accepting the truth of the gospel. That's life-changing. So don't, don't neglect that this morning. Let me pray for us. Father God, we praise you that, that you are a God of mercy, not just a God of justice, but a God of mercy and grace. Father, we're sinners. Each and every one of us here today, 
Every brother and sister in this room, every person listening to this, Lord, we are all sinners in need of a Savior. We praise you today that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty that was due because of our sin. And thank you that you, in your mercy and love, have saved us. And that you have placed a calling on our lives to share the gospel, to live out the gospel. Father, I pray that you would help each and every one of us today to to live as if we believe that the gospel is true, because, Lord, we do. We do believe that this gospel is true, that this gospel changes not only our lives, but the lives of every person who responds to this gospel. Father, I pray that your name would continue to be glorified through your people here at this church, that, that you would give them a heart and a desire to reach this community. And I pray that in Jesus' name.